Уважаемая госпожа Гетта Мюллер, уважаемые американские коллеги, дорогие друзья, студенты, профессора, преподаватели, я должен с огромным удовольствием сказать, что мы имеем честь сегодня принимать у нас в институте госпожу Рос Гетта Мюллер, заместитель государственного секретаря Соединенных Штатов Америки, человек очень хорошо известно и в своей стране, и далеко за ее э, пределами. Я говорю по-русски, поскольку Рос прекрасно говорит по-русски и э, является одним из э, известных специалистов э, и по проблемам разоружения, нераспространения, и является одним из известных специалистов по России. И более того, э, Рос, пройдя через по карьерной лестнице через много разных ступенек, работы и в науке, и в Совете по международным делам, и в Министерстве энергетики. Несколько лет провела здесь, в Москве, возглавляя Московский центр Карнеги. И наш университет, который с центром сотрудничал, участвовал не в одном проекте центра, но нам даже довелось вместе с госпожой Гетты Мюллер редактировать очень интересную работу, связанную с северокорейской ядерной проблемой. Мы не знали, что она так долго продержится, и а, сегодня станет опять одной из самых актуальных международных делах. Там принимали участие наши профессора, а мы выступали в качестве соредакторов этого издания, которое было совместно сделано ГИМО и Центром Корны. Но понимая, что у нас не так много времени, я, пожалуй, ограничу приветствие свое вот этими словами и э, с удовольствием передам слово госпоже Гитамире. Вы будете по-английски говорить. Да, да. По-английски вопросы будет. можно задавать по-английски и когда вы закончите, вы по-русски. Пожалуйста. Хорошо, как мне а как вам удобно? Может быть, там я стою, Хорошо. если можно. Нет проблем. Нет, нет, абсолютно. Дайте вам только водичку. Так кажется. Хорошо. Well, I will speak English today. I figured it would be good practice for everybody. This is my first opportunity to speak about a subject that I've been talking about uh, all over the United States. Uh, first at Stanford University in October, then at the University of Seattle in January, and uh, then at Yale University uh, not so very long ago. So you're my first audience of students in Russia but I wanted to talk to you today about 21st century statecraft and the use of the information revolution in 21st century diplomacy. Thank you very much uh, to the rector. He's my great friend, Anatoly Tarkunov, and also my uh, well-respected professional colleague. I'm so happy to be here again at Megimo and to have a chance to, to speak. So thank you for your kind introduction. As you probably all know, uh, I am the chief negotiator on the U.S. side of the New START Treaty. Anatoly Antonov was the uh, chief negotiator on the Russian side. It's just had its first birthday. The New START Treaty has just passed its first birthday, and it's been very successful in its implementation. As Foreign Minister Lavrov has said, the New START Treaty is a new gold standard for agreements of this kind. Not only does the treaty facilitate a strengthening of the security of Russia and the USA, but it will also have a positive effect on international stability and security in general. I could not agree more. And New START was just the beginning. President Obama made it clear in his now famous Prague speech that the United States is committed to seeking the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. He reiterated his vision in Seoul earlier this week. In his remarks at the Nuclear Security Summit, the President said that he knew that this goal would not be reached quickly, perhaps not in my lifetime, but I know we have to begin with concrete steps. In order to pursue the goal of a world without nuclear weapons, we are going to have to think bigger and bolder. With this in mind, I have been challenging myself and my colleagues in Washington to think about how we use the knowledge of our past together with the new tools of the information age. 
I look out at a crowd like you and I realize you understand these tools of the information age a lot better than I do. I'm still trying to figure out how to use my iPad. But for you, this is all very, very natural. That's why, as I said, I've been talking to students all over the United States and I really welcome this chance to talk to you here in Moscow today. I'd like to talk first about the changing nature of diplomacy and then talk about how I think the new information technologies can help us on the road to zero. Diplomacy today is very different than it was at the dawn of the nuclear age. I think your careers, if you go into diplomatic service, will be much, much different than the careers that diplomats have had up to this point. Treaties and agreements are not being formulated anymore in smoke-filled rooms by old and grizzled diplomats who are taking endless amounts of time to get those treaties done. More often, diplomacy is happening in the open and at quicker speeds. We diplomats must learn to work and thrive under the new circumstances of the information age. Even in my own life, diplomacy has changed incredibly. I was a junior member of the U.S. START delegation in 1990 and 1991, an experience that served me very well in negotiating the new START treaty in 2009 and 2010. I remember how things were done back then. Masses of paper had to be shuttled among our delegation, our U.S. delegation, and between the U.S. and the Soviet delegation. We were constantly burning out Xerox machines and faxes flowed back and forth between Geneva and Washington. You probably don't even remember the fax machines. How many around the room know how to operate a fax machine? Oh, I see a few hands going up. So there are a few who know about fax machines, but it's really like a dinosaur. It's pretty much disappeared forever. When the New START negotiations began in April of 2009, the world had changed. The US and Russian delegations launched into the negotiations committed to keeping them respectful and businesslike, even when we did not agree, and we, did, we had to agree to disagree in private. That was very good considering how quickly information flowed between Geneva and capitals and could flow also out to the public, out to the press. So it was very important to keep that commitment to confidentiality. For me, the biggest change in how we did business was email. Instead of making hard copies and waiting days or weeks for what we call snail mail, we instead were sending emails back and forth and it really sped things up, made things so much faster. We could get word back from Washington sometimes within hours for both classified and unclassified messages. After some discussion, we also agreed with our Russian colleagues to exchange negotiating documents electronically although on disks and not via email. Still, even CDs made a big difference to after-hours communication. There's a famous story from the START negotiations in the 1990s about how one night our delegation went down to the Russian mission, which is right down the hill from the US mission in Geneva, and there was no guard at the gate. It was late at night. That's what happens in negotiations. You end up working all night long sometimes to get things done. So our delegation said, wow. And the, we could see on the other side of the gate was our diplomatic counterpart. So it wasn't me, but the American diplomat said, well, I'm gonna throw this over to you. And he took the satchel of documents and threw it over the gate of the Soviet mission. And his counterpart caught it and said, thank you very much and went back to work in the Soviet mission. Well, you can see that even in this small case, having a, a CD that you could hand through the bars of the gate would make a big difference to communication. So even in that small way, electronic communications made a big difference. After, in my view, these new approaches to the formal negotiating process, especially our new digital toolbox, were a big factor in the fast pace of our negotiations. It was exactly one year from our first meeting in Rome in April of 2009 to the last meeting of the technical protocol group in April of 2010. No longer bogged down by paper processes, we could move a lot more quickly. 
Nowadays, I don't have to wait until the next time I travel to Geneva or here to Moscow to talk to my counterparts. I can call them up, I can send an email, sometimes I even send a text message, and we can communicate much more quickly in that way. And someday, before too long, I hope to be able to go across the hall from my office and sit in a conference room and send basically a message to get a video conference up and running and to be able to talk via video conference with my counterparts around the world. It would really cut down on jet lag. Uh, the rector and I were just talking about jet lag and how difficult it is to deal with sometimes. So I'd be very happy if I could have video conferences with my counterparts here in Moscow. Now let me turn and talk about the new technologies of the information revolution and how they might apply specifically to arms control. I think we need to be thinking in new ways about how new agreements can and will be verified, monitored and verified. Today we verify that countries are fulfilling their arms control treaty obligations through a combination of information exchange, notifications of weapon status, on-site inspections, and national means, including so-called national technical means. National technical means are big assets, such as observation satellites and phased array radars. These are assets that individual countries manage and control. It's long been a rule of arms control treaties that we don't interfere with each other's national technical means. We allow each other these ears and eyes to monitor treaties. All of the elements I've listed work together to form the verification regime of an arms control treaty. I should say what we mean by effective verification of arms control treaties. Ambassador Paul Nitze, one of the most eminent and senior US arms control negotiators since passed on, I'm sorry to say, defined it as follows. If the other side moves beyond the limits of the treaty in any militarily significant way, we would be able to detect such a violation in time to respond effectively and thereby deny the other side the benefit of the violation. That's what we call effective verification, and it has been the benchmark for verifying compliance of arms control treaties. To help meet this benchmark, I've been asking myself, okay, what has the information revolution produced that can help us to verify treaties? New concepts I recognize are not invented overnight, and we don't understand the full range of possibilities inherent in the information age. But I think we would be remiss if we did not start thinking right now about how such new technologies apply. I want to emphasize that what I'm talking about today are ideas. This is not a policy statement. These are not finished kind of approaches, but they are ideas that I want to put out for you to think about and to begin to get some feedback and some new ideas about how to, to proceed. Our new reality is a smaller, increasingly networked world where the average citizen connects to other citizens in cyberspace hundreds of times each day. They exchange and share ideas on a wide variety of topics. So why not put this vast problem-solving entity to good use? Today, any event anywhere on the planet could be broadcast globally in seconds. That means it's harder to hide things. When it's harder to hide things, it's easier to be caught. As we say, the neighborhood gaze is a powerful tool. I think that these kinds of approaches can help to make us to make sure that countries are following the rules of arms control treaties and agreements. Open source information technologies improve arms control verification in at least two ways. Either as a way of generating new information, first of all, or as analysis of information that is already out there. For example, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency in the United States, we call it DARPA, launched a red balloon challenge in 2009 in recognition of the 40th anniversary of the internet. DARPA held a competition where 10 red weather balloons were moored at visible fixed locations around the United States. The first team to identify the location of all 10 balloons won a, a sizable cash prize, 
over 4,300 teams from around the world took part, composed of over 2 million people from 25 countries. A team from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology won the challenge, identifying all of the balloon locations in a, an astonishingly, astonishingly short time of eight hours and 52 minutes. When I talked to DARPA about this project, they thought it was going to take 48 hours. They were really surprised when MIT came back with the answer in eight hours and 52 minutes. Of course, to win in short, uh, such a short time, the MIT team did not find the balloons themselves. They tapped into social networks with a unique incentive structure that incentivized people to identify a balloon location and also incentivized people to recruit others to the team. Their win showed the enormous potential of social networking and also demonstrated how incentives can motivate large populations to work toward a common goal. Now, how could something like this help us in an arms control context? Let's just imagine that a country, to establish its bona fides in a nuclear reduction environment, may wish to open itself to a verification challenge. A national government would take the decision to open itself to a verification challenge. It could seek to prove it was not stashing extra missiles in the woods or a fissile material production reactor out in the desert. Of course, some form of international supervision would likely be required to ensure the legitimacy of the challenge and its procedure. And we would have to consider whether such a challenge could cope with especially covert environments, such as caves or deep underground facilities. A technique like this, I call it a public verification challenge, might be especially valuable as we move to lower numbers of nuclear weapons. Governments would have an interest in proving that they are meeting their reduction obligations and may want to engage their publics in helping them to make the case. It would be necessary to work together to make sure nations cannot spoof or manipulate the verification challenges that they devise. We also have to bear in mind that there may be limitations placed on citizens uh, who may not have the same freedoms uh, to make use of information in every country around the world. These are both big problems and problems that will have to be confronted to make these kinds of approaches a reality. In addition to developing new information, harvesting and analyzing existing information can be helpful too, and I realize there's probably a lot of this work going on in the Russian Federation as well. Many are analyzing Twitter streams, for example. Leila Shireen Sakhar, a University of Southern California doctoral candidate, designed a computer program to aggregate Twitter data and patterns that enabled her to understand events in both the Arab Spring and Libya's revolution as they were unfolding. The ability to identify patterns and trends in social networks could aid in the arms control verification process. In the most basic sense, social media can draw attention to both routine and abnormal events. We may be able to use data mining to understand where strange effluents are flowing, for example, to recognize patterns of industrial activity or to cue sensors and satellites. Such cueing could help us to make better use of our scarce and, uh, and expensive national technical means, or in some cases to supplement them in important ways. This is a major issue in an age of budget austerity, when the price tag for big hardware like satellites continues to rise. We need big hardware of this kind, but we need to use it in the most effective way possible. In this same vein, we should think about what there is to gain from using open source geospatial databases like Google Earth. Of course, NGOs, students, and private citizens have been using open source satellite images for research for some time now. Did you all know that George Clooney, the famous actor, has made use of these kinds of methodologies? He's one of the most famous and well-known men in the world, of course. But in conjunction with NGOs, academic institutions, and businesses, George Clooney created the Satellite Sentinel Project. SSP uses commercial satellite images to systematically monitor and report on threats to human security in near real time. Digital globe satellites passing over Sudan and South Sudan capture imagery of potential threats to civilians there. The satellites can pick up types and varieties of helicopters, tanks, and multiple rocket launch systems, among other items of concern. 
the Harvard University Humanitarian Initiative analyzes imagery and information from sources on the ground to produce reports. Then, the Enough Project releases the reports to the press and policymakers, sounding the alarm by notifying the news media and civic groups. So here's an interesting synergy. Of course, it's a famous actor, George Clooney, who's, I think, enabled and facilitated the public attention to this effort, but it's a stunning synergy among private groups and private citizens conducting their own monitoring project, analyzing the information, and then publicizing the results via traditional news and social media networks. Beyond movie stars, the information age is creating a greater talent pool of individuals to pursue these kinds of approaches. People can reach a broader, diverse market for their products and services. These private citizens can develop web-based applications for e-book readers, cell phones, and any touchpad communication devices. This kind of crowdsourcing lets everyday people solve problems by getting innovative ideas out of their heads and onto the shelves. And here again, I know that the role of Russian technologists and Russian information experts has been among the most innovative in the world. Open source technology could be useful in the hands of arms control inspectors. Smartphone and tablet apps could be created for the express purpose of aiding in the verification and monitoring process for an arms control treaty. For example, by having all of the safeguards and verification sensors in an inspected facility wirelessly connected to the inspector's iPad, he or she could note anomalies and flag specific items for closer inspections, as well as compare readings in real time and interpret them in context. Some of this is already happening in some of our non-proliferation safeguards programs, and I think it's an interesting trend to continue to develop. However, as we think of new ways to use these tools, we need to be aware that there could be trouble ahead. We cannot assume that information will always be so readily available. As nations and private entities continue to debate the line between privacy and security, it is possible to imagine that now we're living in a golden age of open source information that will be harder to take advantage of in the future. In the end, the goal of using open source information technology and social networks should add to our existing arms control verification capabilities. It's not going to replace what we do nowadays, but we think, I think, it could supplement and add to those capabilities. As I said a moment ago, this speech is not about finished policy. It's about some new ideas. So I wanted to post a challenge to you to come up with some bold and interesting new ideas in this arena to help us in the pursuit of further arms control and non-proliferation policy goals. In Seoul, President Obama said that, your, in your generation, I see the spirit we need in this endeavor, an optimism that beats in the hearts of so many young people around the world. It's that refusal to accept that the world as it is, the imagination to see the world as it ought to be, and the courage to turn that vision into reality. As the U.S. and Russian governments work to enhance and expand our arms control and non-proliferation efforts, we will need your help to find new ways to go about it. So I really welcome the opportunity to speak to you here today. I very much look forward to our discussion and welcome your questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rose, for your excellent presentation. And now we have some time for Q&A session. Professor Mis. Rose, maybe. Может быть, yeah, okay. Нас всех волнует, естественно, будущее российско-американских отношений, в том числе диалога по стратегической стабильности, вопросам контроля над вооружениями, где, в общем, ну, чего греха таить, наступила определенная пауза, о чем вы говорили, да, позавчера, вот выступая в фонде в московском центре Карнеги. Ну, может, это такой немножко 
очень широкий вопрос, но вот с учетом того, что вот эту паузу надо как-то преодолевать, вот не могли бы вы вот, ну, поделиться вот с вашей точки зрения, что в основном должно быть сделано, чтобы вот это преодолеть и вновь начать диалог по этой важнейшей, в общем-то, проблеме, от которой, ну, безусловно, зависит будущее всего человечества. Спасибо. Well, as this is a student audience, you well recognize uh, the value of homework. At least I hope, and your rector hopes that you recognize the value of homework. Домашка. Домашняя работа. I think that this is an important homework period in the U.S.-Russian relationship. We did uh, an enormous enormous amount of work uh, in the last several years in first negotiating and then in both countries ratifying the New START Treaty and bringing it into force. Now we have to think about the future. I know an issue that has been much on uh, the minds of leaders both here in Moscow and also in uh, Washington in the United States is the subject about how are we going to cooperate on missile defenses. It's a very difficult and complicated issue. Of course, uh, there are concerns about missile defense developments over time beginning to undermine the strength of the strategic offensive capabilities uh, of the Russian Federation. So that's a very serious matter, and it must be considered very seriously. In our view, uh, the more we get our technical experts together to talk about the technical details of the so-called European phased adaptive approach that the United States and its NATO allies would like to develop in cooperation with the Russian Federation, the more your technical experts understand about the technical capabilities that would go into that phased adaptive approach, the more your confidence will grow, Russia's confidence will grow in the, in the uh, capabilities of uh, that system. And you'll, we hope, understand that it will not, in fact, undermine Russia's strategic offensive deterrence. So I was actually very encouraged when President Medvedev and uh, President Obama spoke to the press uh, in Seoul, and both of them placed an emphasis on getting technical experts together to talk about this important subject, because it's high time, I think, that we get down to that kind of domашная uh, работа. Thank you. Пожалуйста. Дорогая Роуз, очень рад видеть вас в МГИМО. И э, хотел бы, э, я доцент Ахтамзян, мы встречались, э, начиная с периода более чем 20 лет тому назад. Mm -hmm. э, я хотел бы задать вопрос, связанный с только что завершившимся э, саммитом в Сеуле. Mm -hmm. В какой степени Россия и США могут внести свой вклад в решение проблем ядерной безопасности особенно э, под углом зрения борьбы с ядерным терроризмом. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, you know, it is really, I think, a remarkable partnership that the United States and Russian Federation have developed over the 20 years since the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, and it has come about through some very, very hard work both between our nuclear scientists in the so-called laboratory-to-laboratory program of cooperation, uh, between our uh, militaries, our ministry, your Ministry of Defense, our Department of Defense in the so-called cooperative threat reduction program. But we have developed a very uh, pragmatic and very extensive working relationship to enhance the physical protection of weapons usable nuclear material. And now that experience is being applied beyond our bilateral relationship, beyond uh, the United States, Russian territory, to other countries in the world. And that is the, the meaning of a number of initiatives that have gotten started that the United States and Russia co-chair. For example, the uh, global initiative to counter nuclear terrorism is one that the United States and Russia uh, co-chair, and it's all about capacity building elsewhere in the world. It's about building capacity in other countries. There are now 85 countries that are participating in this effort, but it is uh, U.S. and Russian leadership 
that is really making, making this, uh, this counterterrorism effort work. And I agree with everything that was said in Seoul during the summit about the threat of nuclear terrorism being the biggest threat we face today. We don't face a threat from the Russian Federation. The Russian Federation doesn't face a threat from the United States or from the NATO alliance. It's these, these more difficult and more um, hidden threats, the threat of nuclear terrorism that we have to figure out in very, I would say, uh, complicated ways we have to figure out how to how to fight against and so I think that that is uh, in my view one of the top priorities we're going to have to tackle together in coming years so I'm glad we have some programs already established where the US and Russia are putting to use the good experience that we've gained over the last 20 years on fissile material protection control and accounting Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the students of GIMO, I'd like to express our gratitude for you, to you for your visit to our university and for your interesting lecture on uh, new technologies in, the, in, the, in diplomacy. But my question is more closer to, uh, is closer to, uh, to weapons and the situation in the Middle East. I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, don't you think that, in, uh, that there, there isn't a uh, rise in the amount of, uh, the amount of uh, conventional weapons in uh, the, the, the region over the last few years will uh, lead to more human rights violations in such countries as Syria, for example. And to what, what are the measures uh, taken by the United States in particular to uh, prevent uh, weapons spreading in the region? Thank you. Oh, that is a very good question because, of course, I think we are all concerned about, uh, about the flow of weapons uh, around the Middle East and uh, concerned about arms race uh, tendencies among uh, some countries in the region. Again, we've been trying to take a very direct approach and frankly in some of these areas we've been working very closely with the Russian Federation. Let's take the problem of man pads. Mm, I'm not sure how to say man pads in Russian, but these are these shoulder mounted uh, uh, kind of rocket launchers that can be used by individuals and transported pretty readily. Um, they, we call them man pads. And there was a great proliferation of such weapons around the Middle East in places like Libya. So it's been very important that the US and Russia have been able to work together to try to, um, to, try to tackle the problem of man pads proliferation because you recognize this is a problem not only in, uh, in local conflicts around these regions, but it could uh, prove to be a problem for civil aviation, for example. You might remember over a decade ago when there were some man-pad attacks on civil uh, aircraft departing from uh, airports in Africa. And so it's constantly uh, a threat, constantly a worry. So the degree to which Again, we can cooperate on trying to tackle this problem, I think, is, is very important. So I would say you point to a very real threat, and it's one uh, I think that's best, uh, best tackled if we can figure out ways to do it together. Thank you. Uh, dear Rose, uh, let me welcome you once more, and thank you for uh, your conference here. Uh, I'd like uh, to stress that the history of uh, the relationships uh, among our country and uh, the United States uh, uh, is very rich and uh, has had both uh, good and bad times. Though uh, today I want to um, recall the speech of President Obama in 2008 in Chicago when he said that we are not enemies but friends. And though the passion has, may have strained, it must not uh, break the bounds of our countries. Uh, and for this reason, do you think uh, that America is able in future to give our, our, us, our country, guarantees 
that uh, this uh, European uh, missile uh, defense system won't be against our country. And why don't you, why don't your country want to uh, co cooperate with us, creating this uh, system in Europe? Thank you. Thank you. Actually, you know, uh, this is one area where we have been very consistent in expressing our uh, interest in, in cooperation. And furthermore, uh, at the highest level, uh, that is our president, uh, has uh, said that this system is not a threat uh, to the Russian Federation. It is not a threat uh, to the s capabilities of the strategic uh, offensive uh, nuclear forces of uh, the Russian Federation. So there's been some uh, confusion at times. People say, oh, you're not willing to put that in writing. Well, uh, the president himself has said that we're willing to put that in writing. So I think it's, it's important as we engage in this debate to try to be as accurate as possible uh, about exactly what the threats are and uh, what the possibilities for cooperation are and what the mechanisms for policy interaction are as well. And I consider it a very serious matter that my president has confirmed to your president and will be willing to continue to do so, that this system is no threat to the Russian Federation or any of your military capabilities. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your conference once again. And uh, I would like to ask a very simple question. In your judgment, uh, who ought to play the reading, uh, leading role in resolving the nuclear impasse that's going on in the North, Co North, in the North Korean region? Well, in North Korea specifically. Uh, should it be the United States by means of new sanctions or should it be China, which, is, uh, which has historically very close ties with the North Korean regime. So could you give us some, some brief review of the, of the North Korean conflict and your relations with the Chinese, with your Chinese counterparts? Thank you. Yes, well, in the case of North Korea, it's not only uh, the United States and, and China who have had an interest in this matter. Uh, in the past, the so-called six-party talks have involved also Russia, South Korea, Republic of Korea, and also Japan. So there are a number of countries who have been involved in trying to, to resolve this issue uh, with North Korea. We thought that we were headed in a good direction again uh, back in February. Uh, we call it the so-called Leap Day Agreement because on the 29th of February it was agreed, uh, we thought, that uh, the Koreans would, uh, North Koreans would uh, cease uh, to uh, conduct the activities of concern to us with regard to both their missile program and also their nuclear program and begin to take some steps to establish, again, their bona fides in a way that would enable us to return to the six-party talks. Unfortunately, we've been very concerned about the announcement of uh, a long-range missile test coming up in mid-April. They uh, are saying that it's a space launch, uh, but uh, we are very concerned that it's, a, in essence, a test of their long-range missile capabilities. So at the moment, uh, we're not in a very good place uh, with regard to North Korea, uh, but it is important uh, to underscore that this is not a matter for just China or just the United States, but there's this entire, I would say, responsible group of countries who have been trying to work this problem, and, and Russia is very much one of them. So. I, for one, hope that we can get back uh, to the six-party talks, uh, but first, uh, North Korea is going to have to take some steps in our direction, and at the moment, I'm sorry to say, they seem to be heading in the wrong direction. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your lecture. And uh, the question that is, I guess, everyone, everyone here heard um, is connected with the statement that Barack Obama gave uh, that um, nuclear terrorism is the most um, important question and as well 
um, it is the threat to the international security and society. And in connection with that, I'd like to ask you a question, whether it will be possible to reduce or at least limit the number of uh, nuclear uh, weapons, as well as uh, to um, prevent them from getting into the wrong hands, especially when the countries like Pakistan um, haven't agreed to the conference of disarmament. Thank you. Thank you, that's a very good question. I think, I think you have to consider, when you're thinking about the threat of nuclear terrorism, you have to consider a very wide spectrum of threats. Some of them are much worse than others. At this end of the spectrum, you have to be worried about even things like radiological sources that are used for cancer treatment in hospitals. If radiological sources got into the hands of terrorists, they could be used to create a so-called dirty bomb. Now, a dirty bomb's not going to kill a lot of people, but it would spread terror. It could contaminate an area of a city for a, for a very significant amount of time. So we care, about, we care about getting radiological sources under control and ensuring that they're well accounted for by hospitals, by cancer treatment centers, by other uh, universities that are, are engaged in that uh, kind of work. Then you go to fissile materials. Fissile materials are materials like highly enriched uranium, plutonium that can be used in a nuclear weapon. Do we care? Yes, we care because uh, it's possible that uh, if a terrorist organization got their hands on enough fissile material that they could produce a crude nuclear weapon. So we're concerned about controlling fissile material. And that was the purpose of the nuclear security summit in Seoul uh, that took place last week. And there'll be another one in 2014. The first one was in 2010. The whole idea is to get fissile material under better, safer, uh, more effective control over the next now two and a half years. So between 2010 and 2014, a four-year plan to get fissile material under better control around the world. And then the final, at the most difficult end of the spectrum, is the problem you point to, that nuclear weapons could go missing. Loose nuclear weapons could be stolen, could fall into the wrong hands. And that is, I think, uh, the important impact of the work that we've done with the Russian Federation over the last 20 years, is to w raise awareness of the need to make sure that uh, nuclear weapons and fissile material are under the highest standards of international uh, protection, monitoring, and accounting to ensure that we really have a good idea where they all are and uh, they are protected, and to raise awareness among countries all over the world about this problem. Uh, so whether they have fissile material or, uh, or warheads, that they, they have a very high standard of protection and control. So it's not by any means a problem that's been solved, but it's one that we've been paying a lot of attention to. So we hope, we hope over the next couple years that these standards will be uh, more universally applied on an international basis. Thank you so much for such an outstanding presentation. I have the following question. What do you think is the approximate time of having the goal of zero achieved in terms of nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation? Thank you. Ah. Well, I mentioned, uh, I mentioned that President Obama has said several times that this is a long-term goal. He has said very clearly, not in my lifetime. And he's a pretty young man. Uh, he's younger than I am. <laughs> So uh, I think we're looking at it as a long-term goal. But the importance of this as a matter of U.S. policy is it's placed out there a very, very clear goal to de-emphasize nuclear weapons in U.S. military strategy. And this has had a strong doctrinal effect in the United States where we're pursuing, you know, looking at what this means doctrinally. What does this mean? for U.S. military strategy over time, but it's, it's really set a particular goal that has been, uh, I think, a strong and important goal for US, U.S. policy going forward. But when you think about getting to zero nuclear weapons, you recognize, as does the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which also places as a goal 
eventual nuclear disarmament. But the Non-Proliferation Treaty very clearly expresses what the President also has said, that we have to first solve a number of very serious and difficult regional security problems, whether you look at the Middle East today, you look at the Far East with North Korea, all around the world there are many, many very complicated and difficult regional security issues that will have to be tackled before we can get to that goal of a world without nuclear weapons. And the President recognizes that, as does, I think, the, the international community overall. But, you know, Senator Sam Nunn has said it very well when he said you have to place that goal, even if you can't see the top of the mountain because it's shrouded in fog, you still have to get the goal out there so that you keep climbing toward it no matter what. And I think that's a very, very important image to bear in mind. Get the goal out there and you can start climbing toward it. Thank you. First of all, thank you for your lecture. And my question is as follows. As we know, the politics of openness and transparency in diplomacy have proven to be very effective in the relations of Russia and the USA. However, it seems hard to involve some countries of the Middle East and Pakistan and North Korea into this system and to pursue, persuade them to open all their data and involve them into this transparent diplomacy. Do you think it is possible to involve them into the system? And how long may it take? Thank you. It's, uh, again, a very, a very good question, uh, and one I think that we have to we have to consider in a very deliberate and serious way. But when the uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference took place in 2010, we laid out a particular goal of getting the so-called P5 together. The P5 are the nuclear weapons states under the NPT. They include United States and Russia, UK, France, and China. And now we have begun to meet on a regular basis. We met last June in Paris. We're going to be meeting again this coming summer in the United States, in Washington. And just the fact of getting us together on a regular basis, I think, is very important in beginning to develop the habit of discourse that will be very important uh, going toward the future and beginning to develop uh, an agenda uh, that, uh, that leads us to more cooperation on this uh, nuclear disarmament matter. It's the same uh, involving other countries, such as India and Pakistan, to the degree that we have opportunities. And as a matter of, of U.S. policy, we've been saying to them, look, you're not a member of the NPT, but if you're going to have nuclear weapons, you need to have um, a high standard of policy. You need to step up to your responsibilities as a country that has nuclear weapons. And so we've been urging them, for example, to sign the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, to join with us in negotiating a fissile material cutoff treaty, because we believe that although they're not members of the NPT, the very fact, in my view, unfortunately, but the very fact that they have nuclear weapons nevertheless means that they have to take a responsible attitude on the international stage and pursue these, these areas of a responsible policy. So we'll continue to press that um, and we'll see what happens in the coming years. We certainly think that it's uh, possible to develop partnership on these matters no matter what. And, uh, and so sometimes I feel, I don't know if you have an expression in Russian, pushing a rock uphill. Sometimes I feel like I'm pushing a rock uphill and then it, it rolls back down again. But we keep trying to push the rock uphill on, uh, on this kind of question. Informative lecture, and uh, I have uh, two questions, if you let me ask. Uh, first is that, what are interests of the United States in the Asia-Pacific in the regard of military rise of China? Mm -hmm. uh, are um, United States uh, 
uh, do they intend uh, do it intend to circle China and to keep its navy forces in green waters? Are, and uh, the second question uh, is uh, in the regard of um, uh, Iran problem, uh, nuclear nuclear problem problem now. Uh, what is uh, uh, the opinion of the United States uh, uh, about uh, the war in the Middle East in general? Because if uh, the United States really support the, uh, the uh, uh, attack of Israel to Iran, then it leads to the uh, outright war in the Middle East. And do you really want it? I mean, the United States. Thank you. The United States never wants war. <laughs> But thank you, those were very good questions, both very complicated questions. Uh, the first on China, you know, the United States uh, has recently uh, announced a shift uh, in our, nu uh, not nuclear, but a shift in our military uh, policy overall with a new focus on Asia. And the uh, significance of this is that the United States recognizes that uh, economic and uh, the economic and commercial kind of balance is shifting in many ways toward Asia and that we need to be paying attention to that economic uh, shift. It's uh, the United States, as the President has said, President Obama has said, has long been a Pacific power. It's one of our coasts, after all, as we call it the left coast. Left, you know, in the United States is more liberal, more, but California, the more liberal part of the country, we call it the left coast, but it's also our Pacific coast. So the United States has long been a Pacific power. And the shift as we place more emphasis on uh, Asia, in this case, it's a shift that we hope to uh, implement together with China. We have common interests in maintaining, for example, uh, the free flow of commerce by making sure that the sea lanes remain open uh, throughout, uh, throughout Asia. And so I think we should think about it in terms of making common interest with countries in the region, not only with China, but uh, with Australia, for example, our mar Marines will be uh, in a new base in northern, uh, not a new base, but for them a new base in northern Australia. It's making common purpose with countries throughout the region in order to ensure that the shift of economic uh, focus to the Far East, to Asia, in fact, uh, can be carried forward and the flow of commerce can proceed very smoothly without, without running into difficulties. So we see this as rather a, a cooperative effort with countries in the region, including with China. As far as uh, Iran is concerned, all I can say is uh, that we have, I think, had a good success in recent months in developing uh, this uh, systemic uh, program of sanctions uh, against Iran that has really ratcheted up the pressure and in my view has created the right environment, a good environment now for negotiations. So we um, very much hope that we can work through the issues that we have with Iran, get Iran back to fulfilling its commitments to the International Atomic Energy Agency, answering the questions of the international community about its, uh, about its nuclear program. Iran, of course, has the right to a peaceful nuclear power program, but so many questions have emerged in recent years about what exactly Iran is doing because so much of it is kept under wraps and the questions of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the international community are not answered. So we hope that we will have some talks coming up in the coming weeks and we will be able to answer uh, some of these questions, that Tehran will be willing to answer some of these questions and that we can begin to solve this problem because once again, nobody wants war. Not the United States, not Israel, not any of our countries who are allies in Europe and certainly not in the Middle East as well, and I know the Russian Federation also. So, so I hope that what is uh, in the offing now with new negotiations will produce some, some positive results. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'd like to ask a very U.S.-centered um, question now because uh, I'm very concerned about uh, some positions in our Congress 
And I think that our, our negotiations with the Russian Federation should be um, as most uh, dissociated from uh, domestic issues as possible. So hearing some declarations by John Kyle or John Bolton very concerning for me for, uh, sometimes, knowing that our partnership with the Russian Federation is so precious and that uh, we hold a leadership role as uh, regards to disarmament worldwide. So how do you think we can dissociate uh, the issue of politics from the more technocratic, the more security-related uh, issues that uh, benefit both our reasons of state? How do you think we can dissociate, how do you think we can democratize, better uh, connect our citizens to the public and diplomatic sphere? Uh, because I, I thought that your comments on Twitter ver were very enlightening, and for that, I thank you very much. Well, thank you for the very good question, and all I can say, my answer to you is, it's impossible. <laughs> the reality of the situation, I could say, as we say, welcome to my world. <laughs> The reality of the situation is that we can find technocratic solutions, and you and your careers will probably be working very hard to find policy solutions. As you say technocratic, I call them policy solutions to difficult problems wherever you work, whether it's in the banking world, in commerce, in diplomacy. You're going to have to tackle some very, very difficult substantive and policy problems. But there's always going to be aspects of politics, politics that come and sometimes have an influence on what you're doing, particularly if you're in government service. There's no way to escape it. So I think the best answer is the way we handled the ratification of the New START Treaty, which it's no secret, it was difficult. There was a very tough debate in the U.S. Senate about the New START Treaty, and yes, some of that debate was definitely flavored by politics. Um, and especially in a year like 2012, which is an election year, the politics get ratcheted up and up and up. So it's just the reality of the situation. I found that the best way to try to deal with it is to speak very honestly about the value of the policy for U.S. national security. In my case, I was arguing for the New START Treaty being in U.S. national security interests. So I was taking the treaty to the Senate, talking about the great uh, details of the inspection regime, for example, the great details of uh, the various procedures that are associated with it, and making the argument that it is in U.S. national security interests. I'm sure that your diplomats, your military men were doing the same thing with the State Duma and with the Federation Council here to make the case. But still, um, I'll tell you quite honestly that I had a lot of very tough political questions and a lot of very tough political criticism. It's just, it's part of our lives. It's the reality of the situation and we have to deal with it. You made a good point though about public attention and public interest. One of the reasons I think that we had good success with the New START Treaty was that so many uh, both uh, public groups and various общественные uh, организации became very interested in it. For example, uh, some very, normally you would think of them as conservative religious groups like the Catholics and the uh, Southern Baptists uh, became very, very committed to the ratification of the New START Treaty because they do not believe in nuclear deterrence. They believe nuclear deterrence is immoral as a matter of national belief of, of religion. And so they came to help us support the treaty in the Senate. So it is very important to get the word out to the public, get the word out to, to NGOs, to expert groups, to social organizations, and to make your case, because sometimes they can become very, very strong allies and be very helpful to your cause. So that's all I can say on that, but it's just the reality of the situation. Politics is always going to be with us. Спасибо большое. Но, к сожалению, у нас истекло время, дорогие друзья. Я хотел бы еще раз сердечно поблагодарить нашу гостю, э, поблагодарить и за то, что вы приехали к нам, выступили, ответили очень, как мне кажется, открыто, подружески на вопросы, которые были в аудитории. Может, вопросов гораздо было. много больше, но yeah. на все вопросы, видимо, ответить. Э, достаточно трудно в рамках короткого визита. Я хотел бы сказать, что, естественно, все присутствующие заинтересованы в том, чтобы на 
в тех направлениях, на которых трудитесь вы, были успехи. Это прежде всего не распространение, это прежде всего сотрудничество международное и российско-американское сотрудничество в решении этих вопросов, поскольку это вопрос и безопасности наших стран. И, конечно, это вопросы, которые волнуют всех и простых граждан, поскольку мы понимаем, что проблемы нераспространения, как бы они ни казались далеки от жизненных потребностей каждодневно нашей повседневной жизни, они так или иначе действительно нас волнуют, потому что мы понимаем возможные последствия всякого рода происшествий, в том числе, о чем вы говорили, и о грязной бомбе, и так далее, и о возможностях использования террористами такого рода оружия. Поэтому, мне кажется, Сеульский саммит – это большой успех, и мы рады, что существует взаимодействие на самом высшем уровне между руководителями России и Соединенных Штатов на этом направлении. И, конечно, дипломаты и российские, и американские, которые работают в этой области, они должны, как мне кажется, сотрудничать самым теснейшим образом. Я хочу вам пожелать успехов от имени всех присутствующих и спасибо вам за участие во встрече. Если можно одно слово, я просто хотела передать вам всем ну, большой комплимент. Ваш английский язык великолепный, так что спасибо большое. Я бы хотела очень выступать на русском языке, но просто я не успела, не умела возможности все это на русском языке узнать, как сказать. Так что большое, огромное спасибо, что вы задавали все вопросы на такой прекрасный английский язык. It's спасибо большое. Это хороший тренинг для наших студентов и для нас. Да, exactly, exactly. Thank you very, very Спасибо, much. ребят. Сейчас я буду...